Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Now, it's finally time to make a uh, proper video about the big brother of the micro long range. Uh, the mini long range. So, just to clarify this up front, I mean, this quad here, this light 5 inch, is actually not intended to replace the mini long range or the uh, sort of Flywoo Explorer class, so this class of micro long range quads. It's actually a different thing and I'll get to why it's really a, a different thing with sort of a slightly different purpose in a second. Uh, but it's not, I mean, it's not like a new version of the uh, of the micro long range, it's a different thing. And um, so I get you into the overall concept of this, of this configuration, uh, flight performance and details of the frame construction in this video. All right, so what's the point of the mini long range? I mean, if we look at it, it's sort of in between a um, regular 5 inch, because it uses the same prop size. This one, by the way, weighs 400 grams, while this one only weighs 200 grams. And a micro long range, it can be sub 250. So, what's what's really the point? I mean, um, it's not sub 250 like the micro long range, so you don't have that advantage. It doesn't have the full power and performance and weight to throw around of, a, of an actual 5 inch. So, what's the point here? In my opinion, the main point is uh, batteries, and because it is a pretty good match for these um, lithium ion packs built out of Sony VTC6 cells. So uh, I think on 5 inch you would have a problem running this pack because it does only does 30 amps continuous. It's not enough to run a 400 gram 5 inch. You could build a 2P pack, so 2 cells in parallel, so overall 8 cells, but then you have a 400 gram battery which is quite a lot of load on a 5 inch um, prop disc. You could use uh, 21700 cells which give you 40 amps but that's still not really enough for, for this. So you're, you're, kind of, um, you're kind of stuck a little bit. Either you overload the props with a 2P battery that can supply uh, 60 amps continuous but weights 400 grams or you're stuck with a battery that uh, doesn't supply enough amps and here and this setup, which is really not very amp hungry, this uh, sort of works out quite perfectly. Uh, 30 amps are more than you need for this one. You can punch out, do real punch outs without the, the battery sagging away. Um, it's a 200 gram battery on a 200 gram quad, so still quite heavy for the quad, but you have this large disc area, uh, which can, without any issues, uh, support this big pack without overloading the props and making the quad extremely, uh, extremely noisy and really working and, and being very, very inefficient. Now, um, I know the micro long range can also carry this 4S, no problems, but I mean, in that case, it's a 200 gram battery on a 160 gram quad, so um, you lose more performance because of the extreme weight of this pack compared to the 5 inch. So uh, it's just more capable of carrying the heavier battery compared to the micro long range. And, um, but it's not over distressing the battery like this uh, regular 5 inch. That's for me a little bit the point of having this light 5 inch long range cruiser. It's really a, an excellent match for flying on lithium ion. So let's look at um, setups. So I've built two of these for testing purposes. Um, one is a 6S setup and the other one is a 4S setup. Um, main objective was to see if uh, which one makes more sense. So what I like to do for long range cruisers is actually have a 6S setup but for cruising run them on 4S because it gives you more efficiency and a very high throttle resolution. So you sort of, it feels like cutting off 30% uh, of the top end but then you have more resolution and lower areas of the throttle so you can fly more precisely and smoother which is very helpful for uh, getting decent footage and then cruising but if you want more power you just throw a 6s on there and you have the full uh, 6s power craziness uh, but also I just wanted to compare this with a 4s set, uh, an actual 4s setup so this one's got beta fpv um, 2550 kv motors and this one's got 1950 kv motors i wanted to compare this and um i have to say I really prefer this 6S setup and this 2004, 2004, um, no, 2004, sorry, 2004 motor size here um, for several reasons. So first, 
um, yes, on the higher KV on a 4S lithium ion, which is what I used to compare, um, the higher KV does have more punch and more power, but it's not like, uh, I mean, honestly, for cruising purposes and flying wrong, I wasn't really using all that extra power. It was sort of useless. While the motors were noticeably less efficient, they run sort of hot. While um, on the 2004s, which are also, I have to say, very different construction compared to these 1805s, these are uh, these have more uh, more poles. Magnets are weaker, so it's a smoother motor. If I move it like it's really not notchy, while well, this one is super notchy. Um, so these are, anyways, on the more efficient side. They got even more efficient because of the low KV and even smoother, way easier to tune. So I sort of had enough power on 4S, but it was extremely efficient, and I could just throw this small 6S on there, and then this was almost a powerhouse. I mean, not as powerful as a f heavy 5207s, but it had quite a lot of power. So I really preferred the sort of dual pulp pur purpose motor and the smoother motors because I did have a very hard time tuning this one. Uh, on an 1805s, I do not know why. Uh, I suspect it's the motors could also be how the the all-in-one here is mounted. But this one did have pretty bad wobbles, so it was really wobbly, especially on the stock tune. I managed. Um, so the footage you're seeing is on stock tune, and managed to tune out some of it, but still it was from the get-go it was sort of wobbly, and I don't really know why. I suspect. Um, the taller stator does have a harder time managing the prop. I mean, dead cat frames tend to wobble sometimes. They're hard to tune, which is why I think I will also do a, um, a straight X version of this, but it's not, not a very extreme dead cat layout. So I was kind of surprised how badly these 1805 motors handled, um, handled the quad. Might also explain why Beta FPV uh, just came up with a 2004 motor themselves. So I think these seem to be more appropriate for these light five inch setups. Um, so really preferred the, um, really preferred the 2004 uh, 6S version here, the Brother Hobby motors, way better performance in my opinion, really, really good dual purpose cruiser. And um, I mean, it's quite surprising that this is a tiny 556S pack, but it does five minutes of uh, pretty aggressive freestyle on it. No problem. And with this pack, it's just extremely, extremely light. So I think this pack is, uh, for how heavy it is, let me quickly check. How much is this pack? Um, it's 100 grams, so uh, this quad is 200 grams dry, so you have a 300 gram, um, 300 gram overall setup, which is very light for 5 inch uh, and gives you a great performance. Another difference between these two, I mean, this is um, Brother Hobby. Let me get those in focus. Ah, come on. These are Brother Hobby motors. Uh, Fly Woo Stack and a Cadex Vista. Apart from that, these two are identical, um, but this one's got an all-in-one. Now, I mean, I think this better FPV all-in-one board is probably pretty good. It's 6S, 35 amps radius, so way more than enough for the setup. Uh, but, it, I mean, to me, it doesn't really have much of an advantage to uh, have an all-in-one. I mean, yes, um, a nice thing is, I mean, I could fit, uh, let me try to get this on the video. I managed to fit the capacitor in the frame here because it leaves so much room that there's this little 1000 microfarad cap on top of the board. That's an advantage. Apart from that, uh, well, quite honestly, I um, I don't really see... I don't really see much benefits of having an all-in-one board. Um, here with the 20x20 20 20 stacks, uh, it's just sort of easier to wire. Uh, you've got more space, probably uh, it's more reliable, you got a better heat dissipation. So you can use an all-in-one as an adapter in the Thingiverse files. But overall, I really would recommend Robert to go for 20, 24 motors uh, and 20x20 20 20 stacks. Then another thing I tried is the crossfire mount. So this one's got the crossfire in the rear, which has got a slight disadvantage that if if it, it, it tends that if you f you're flying basically with a side pointing towards yourself, 
you tend to um, get a bit of lower RSSI. So if I do this, you know, as you can see, you're hitting the antenna basically in a very bad, very bad angle. You tend, I tend to lose when I'm a few kilometers away, I tend to lose telemetry, uh, but it never fail saved in this configuration. So I think for me, this is fine. Um, you don't have this problem if it's mounted like this on the side, because I mean, no matter how you orient your quad, the antenna is always pointing to you in the right direction. You really have to stand below it, which probably never happens um, to get this, this um, not very optimal angle. But uh, honestly, I think this mount is just super annoying because you're, you know, you're always bending the antenna. It's just annoying to put the quad in the backpack. So I think I'm gonna run this because even if I do fail safe, it's got return to home. It's actually not that bad. Usually it just catches itself, but it never fails safe. They're just losing telemetry from time to time. So I think this is my preferred configuration. But both mounts are on Thingiverse, and you could also use the. Uh, diversity receiver from uh, from TBS. We have one antenna in the front and one in the back. That will work without issue. But for now, from the results of my testing, is I really like this dual purpose 6S setup with 2004 motors, um, lower KV and 20 by 20 stacks. This is what I would recommend. Over okay, so last but not least, let's talk about the frame construction. Um, a little disclaimer beforehand. I mean, I released this thing a little bit earlier than I would usually. So I would still say this is sort of a uh, beta version, mainly because I got quite a lot of requests of people who would just like to test this early version and sort of uh, enjoy being a bit in the process of developing and developing the frame. And I already got some really good uh, feedback uh, from a few guys uh, who, to whom I sent these files early. So special thanks to um, John E5. And um, so sorry, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm butching your name, but Uldis <laughs> Cedros. Uh, um, thanks a lot, guys. The feedback really helped. Um, so I put this out quite early. And I think a few evolutions might still happen, but let's say for me, this is maybe 90 to 95% done um, but let's look at the overall construction of this frame uh, now first thing you're going to notice are these aluminum bolts here quite prominent and shiny so what are these uh, these are let me pull out one of them to show you what these are are the bolts that are holding the chain ring the gear on the crank of your bike so chainring bolts from bicycles. So this is why these are pretty solid. Um, I mean, you four of these usually hold your entire body weight uh, when you're standing on the crank and pulling on the chain. So this is something that can apply quite a quite substantial amount of torque, and this will I mean this will not break. Uh, on the other hand, they are pretty light because it's uh, I mean it's high quality. Uh, a, a high quality, quality aluminum alloy. So what's the advantage of these? I mean, apart from, yeah, yeah, okay, they look nice and shiny, but what's the point actually? And the point for me is, um, there was one question. So on the micro long range, it was quite clear, yes, I would use M2 hardware, uh, arms mounted with M2, but would M2 still work on a five inch? Uh, on the other hand, if I used M3, you know, I would have to use bigger standoffs. Um, it takes up a lot of space, frame gets bigger, weights a lot, but mounting these quite bigger arms and quite bigger motors on M2 didn't seem to be a good idea to me. And also having a sort of mix of M2 and M3, pff, I mean, not a very elegant solution. So basically I use these bike bolts to mount the arms and all the rest is M2. So all the hardware here, the M2 standoff, the M2 screws, these are completely decoupled from the loads that are coming from the arms and the motors. So these bolts, I mean these arms are one piece. Uh, let me pull up one of them. This is an older version of the arm, but um, it's a one piece arm. Mounts it like this. So all the load is basically going into the bolt 
into this uh, quite robust, this is a 2mm plate here, this piece here, into the robust 2mm plate. Uh, so basically all the force is here going to this smaller part and decoupled from all this M2 hardware so I can keep that very light uh, while still having a very robust and stiff middle part here. So complete decoupling of um, M2 hardware and loads. That's the first purpose. The second one, it does considerably um, simplify whole construction. So if you look at a micro long range, it's got a more conservative construction, which is, I mean, which is still better for a four inch. I wouldn't use these bike bolts uh, and this arm construction on this small four inch because it's just too big and um, adds unnecessary weight here. M2 is a much better design choice. But um, I mean, it simplifies things. This one has eight screws for um, for not holding the screws and so on. While here, this is all replaced by these two bolts. Nice simplification of the construction. So this this is the point of these uh, bolts. Of course, they have a um, they have a disadvantage. I mean, of course, I had to join these two arms here. I was quite restricted basically with where I could put the arms because. Uh, one important thing was I needed to have a 90 degree angle here in the arms because I want the carbon fiber to um, not be cut against the weave. So the fibers are um, you know, laminated in a 90 degree angle. So um, the fibers are going along this arm perfectly along with this one. This is why this is exactly a 90 degree angle. So this led to uh, in the slide. So it's a slide. It's not an extreme dead cat layout. Uh, you still have a little bit of props in view, but you won't have props in view of your GoPro that you're carrying. That's the important thing. A little bit of props in the FPV feed, but not as much as you would usually with such big, big props and such a small body. Uh, and you won't have some, uh, won't have any in your HD feed. But um, this slight dead cat layout, the fact that I had to have a 90 degree angle and join them here in one spot, means I do have a pretty long rear arm. Uh, this one's pretty long and thin. And it tends to, I mean, tends to be a little bit soft. So this is something I might have to work on. Uh, maybe have to just beef up this arm a little bit. But I mean, I have a quite long rear arm here, which isn't very, uh, very big advantage. Um, well, I mean, front arm is a regular length. This one's fine. And also, I mean, another smaller advantage I just noticed um, is, I mean, of course, uh, you can quite elegantly root the, the wires here to the ESC since they join here at the spot. Even more relevant if you're using an all-in-one. Uh, it's quite nice here to wire this up. So this, the other noticeable thing about this frame is the construction here in the front. And I mean, since it's a dead cat, you have to put a lot of care in how you design the front of the frame because they are just prone to smash the camera. If we look at the mini uh, micro long range or the Flywheel Explorer here, which is a quite extreme dead cat. Now you always have the problem that um, you know you know the arms are moved back, so you're basically smashing the camera if you crash in the direction of flight, really hitting directly in the camera. So Flywoo um, solved this by just putting some TPU here, so that's a nice solution. And the front is pretty stiff with these side plates, but when compared to a true X, especially a five-inch toothpick like this Beta FPV, for example, uh, where your camera is somewhere around here, if it was a freestyle, it would be somewhere around here. But it's always, you know, always hitting the arms first. On a dead cat, you tend to uh, hit the front part of the frame. So this is where this TPU part comes in. This is quite similar to the Ichin LIL, uh, which I have one coming to compare. So first thing you're hitting is some TPU. So, you know, you absorb the shock, this whole thing can bend. Uh, and then there's the thick 2mm bottom plate brace here you're going to hit next. So you're going to hit some TPU to absorb a bit of shock. You're going to hit some thick carbon. Um, so it's really made to, imp to, to absorb these front impacts. And another nice aspect is um, you have this integrated GoPro mount here, uh, which, of course, will come in quite handy and also looks kind of cool with the aluminum screw here. Um, yeah, that's that's the other important thing is this front part, which is I mean, this one specifically designed for the Catex Vista camera with, um, and I think I'll need to work on more versions of this because I think with anal some analog cameras that have a very nice, a very wide um, field of view, you might have this outer protection ring here in your video feed. So I'll have to check that, but I mean, this is the, no, wait, this is a later version. I mean, this this white one here. That's the latest revision of it. Uh, here you do not have this thing in view, 
of the Canix Vista at least, and I can have this integrated crossfire mount. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's the most important things about the frame construction uh, and I mean, smaller details are here, of course, GPS mount with the integrated crossfire and. Another thing I tried to solve is, uh, I mean, the, the Vista antenna is just too short, the stock antenna, but if you still want to use a stock antenna, I had uh, designed this mount here that sort of uh, extends the whole antenna thing because, I mean, obviously, if you have a big battery on there um, and you have a short stubby antenna that's here in the rear, you do get in a lot of trouble if you're flying towards yourself and the battery is sort of hiding the antenna. So, as you can see, if this one wasn't extended, now here it's still visible, it's still in the line of sight, you'd still have a good video feed, but if it wasn't, it would just be hidden by the battery and you would get in trouble while doing some long range flying. Alright guys, so um, I think that was it, that's all I wanted to share with you. Now, uh, again, all these fights are in Thingiverse for free, you can uh, head over to CNC Madness to get one of these cut, all the details you need are in the... Um, and I think the various article, if you need all the hardware, these bike bolts and the standoffs, I think CNC Madness sells them too. So uh, don't hesitate to, to drop an email to CNC Madness. Alright guys, thanks a lot for watching. Bye bye.